Good morning, everyone. I am very proud to announce and introduce Dr. Scott Poland to help us with this incredibly important topic. Dr. Scott Poland is an internationally recognized expert on school crisis, bullying prevention, youth violence, suicide intervention, self-injury, school safety, threat assessment, parenting, and the delivery of psychological services in schools. He is considered a pioneer in school suicide prevention, having authored one of the most respected works on the subject in his book titled Suicide Intervention in the Schools. He's a co-director of a three-year federal grant for suicide prevention at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. Um, he has been uh, he's our chosen author for several of our Keenan Safe Schools and Keenan Safe Colleges online courses in bullying prevention, suicide prevention. So we are very, very proud to have him today, and we welcome Dr. Scott Poland. Thank you very much, Kathy. It's indeed my hope to say some things will be meaningful and helpful to everyone. I did work for 26 years in the public schools, and sometimes a student would be referred to me who was the victim of bullying. I would often ask the young man or the young woman about the circumstances and what was happening, and Eventually, I would come to the question, did you tell your teacher? And very often, they said yes. And I would ask, well, what would your teacher say? And the response was often, the teacher told me to stay away from those other students. And I think that's a bit simplistic. And we do need to step forward and support the victim and have to recognize that if they're on the playground the same time, riding the same bus, that it's going to be very difficult to stay away from the other students. I was actually on a bullying prevention panel here in Florida just this week. And any time I talk about bullying prevention, I do want to raise questions about suicide prevention and awareness as well. The other day, a teacher said to me, well, you know, if I'm headed down a crowded hallway, I only have a couple of minutes. I see bullying harassment that's going on over there in the corner. You tell me how in four or five minutes I'm supposed to support the victim, provide consequences for the bully, and make it a teachable moment for all those bystanders. And you know, some people have argued the term bystander is way too passive. In reality, we should call them witnesses, and hopefully that would help them step forward to document what's happening and to take some kind of a stand, because I do believe strongly that reaching the bystanders or witnesses is really a key to reducing suicide prevention and bullying prevention in our schools. Principal said to me the other day, this bullying is happening right in the classroom. How do the teachers not know what's going on? Well, sometimes kids can be very covert in their actions. They can be muttering things. And we all do need to pay very close attention. We could spend a long time today talking about statistics. But basically, I think probably everyone who is tuned in does realize that this is a very serious problem. But this next slide does show statistics from the U.S. Department of Education. I think they have an excellent website. Many of you have probably already visited called Stop Bullying Now. You can hear President Obama, Secretary of State Clinton, Secretary of Education Duncan, all saying we've got to do something about bullying in our schools. There's a new term today that I suspect many of you have heard. The term is called bully side. And actually, this term was originally coined for the very rare event when the victim actually committed a homicide and murdered the bully. But that isn't way, the way the term is really being used today. Parents believe very strongly that bullying greatly contributed to the suicide of their child. And they have, in fact, filed lawsuits against schools. Uh, they've tried to provide legal consequences against kids that they believe were bullying their child. And one of those mothers commented, she said, they murdered her as surely as if they'd climbed into her bedroom and stabbed her in her bed. So some very strong viewpoints on the part of parents. And I have a slide up for one case that I was involved in. I'm involved in several others right now that have not reached resolution, but the case in Minnesota, eighth grade boy 
His mom went to the school officials saying that he was being bullied. When they investigated, which schools need to do and do immediately, and talked to him, they found out the bullying was not happening on his middle school campus at all. It was happening more than a mile from school when he walked home, and there were older students from an alternative school who were, in fact, the bullies. And the school felt that they did everything they could, that it was not happening on their campus. And sadly, the young man did die by suicide. Um, the court case and the depositions talked about a number of things that are really, really important. But one of the things I'll never forget is reading a deposition from parents that said, you know, we had two boys. Our family was just too busy. We never had the time to have a meal together. Our boys knew there was always food in the refrigerator. When they would come home, they would take it out. They would eat it in the rooms. And I just believe strongly that so many things can be prevented with communication between adults and children and building relationship between kids and all the adults at school. And I've actually spent an entire career doing what I would call talking the adults out of talking at kids, trying to get adults much more in a listening and an empathetic mode. And an attorney the other day said the, the legal term, what the courts really have to decide is was there a deliberate indifference? Did some school personnel really just absolutely ignore blatant warning signs that a child was being victimized and basically do nothing. And the case for Minnesota was resolved in favor of the school district. The parents appealed. The second court also found in favor of the school district. And it was a tragedy, but the school was not believed to be accountable. The last time I testified in front of Congress, Mrs. Walker was there. Mrs. Walker lost her son, Carl, to suicide. He was 11. He was bullied at school. He was repeatedly called gay. And Mrs. Walker, in her testimony, described she was the involved parent. She tried to do everything right. She went to the school. And Carl was made to feel like he was the problem. They started charting his behavior in every classroom. And then Mrs. Walker elaborated to say that the counselor made Carl have an unsupervised lunch with his biggest tormentor. Sadly, Carl died by suicide. And Mrs. Walker is trying to make a difference. So that raises a number of key questions. What should a parent do if their child is being bullied? Well, hopefully not what a Florida parent did last year, where he got on the school bus and confronted the bullies of his child, and the dad was arrested. In fact, the literature basically says, don't confront the other parents. First and foremost, make certain that you listen to your child. You're very empathetic. You don't in any way convey that you somehow deserve this. Uh, you must be doing something wrong or it wouldn't be happening. Got to be empathetic. Let the child know you're going to be there for them every step of the way, and you're going to be talking to school officials. And it certainly makes sense that a parent would begin with a teacher. But I do know that sometimes it's necessary to document in writing. Sometimes it's necessary to meet with parents uh, and the principal and keep records. In one of the cases I'm reviewing right now where the parents believe that the bullying went on for years, the child was a special education student. I reviewed every single piece of paperwork from the annual and requested special education meetings. And there was never a single indication that the parents believed their child was being bullied. And they state that they transferred him to another school because he was being bullied. But when you look at the actual transfer request, it does not indicate anything other than his parents moved and he went from dad to mom's house. So documentation is very, very important for all parents to make certain that we know absolutely what's going on and that we take action to support our children through a very, very difficult time. 
One of the things I believe really strongly in working in the schools all those years is we've got to build relationship between kids and all the adults at school. Those connections are actually the primary component for key to success, especially for adolescents. The literature is saying that about three-fourths of the time, kids do not tell adults when they're the victim of bullying. And it's important that we look at why and we try to figure out what we can do to change that. And basically, if the teacher doesn't know your name, your hopes, and your dreams, you're going to be very unlikely to trust them to be the person that's going to intervene on your behalf. You may also think that things are only going to get worse. I actually wrote an article called The Fourth R for the School Board Journal trying to emphasize the importance of building relationships with all children. And I think Maslow had it right. He was the guy with the pyramid theory basically saying at the foundation of the pyramid for everyone is the sense of safety, security, belonging, and having our physical needs taken care of. So it's important that every child feels like somebody cares whether or not they come to school today or not. This next slide allows me to talk a little bit about the definition and the concept that bullying is repetitive, bullying is nasty, there's an imbalance of power. Sometimes people are wondering, well, how do you know it isn't good-natured teasing? Well, when two students are teasing each other, they walk away feeling about at the same level. When one of them has been victimized and bullied, they walk away feeling humiliated and very, very low. And it's important that we sit down and talk with those that are being victimized and make sure we empathize and we really get an idea of what kind of power was going on in that last communication. One of the things I'm proud to tell you is that I actually provided bus driver training for over 20 years in my previous job. And I've actually found bus drivers to be among the most motivated school audiences that I've ever had. And they're very instrumental, not only building relationships, but preventing bullying, figuring out who's depressed, making sure that steps are taken to get children the assistance that they need. So the literature also talks about bullying prevention needing to be school-wide. And basically, I'm saying, and we need to include the bus drivers. I've maybe answered a couple of these questions on this next slide. How do we best support the bullying victim? We need to let them know that we are going to get this stopped. If it continues, they need to let adults know. We need to help them develop strategies to minimize the situations uh, where this is occurring. And perhaps the single most important thing that schools should do is survey. Survey and find out. How big a problem is it? We need to be smart enough to ask the students themselves. We need to ask them not only the extent of the problem, but where is it mostly happening? And I suspect the answer in almost every school in America is going to be hallways and bathrooms. And how do we increase our supervision? And I know sometimes teachers would say, I don't want to be in the hallway. In a large secondary high school, there's thousands of kids moving around. They're all really big. School safety and bullying prevention really is an inside job. We've got to get a commitment from the students first, then from the teachers and parents and the rest of the community. Sometimes I'll ask teachers, if you believe a kid is a bully, why don't you pick up the phone and call their parents? When they answer honestly, they say something like, I'm thinking that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And we need to be very measured in our approach to parents. Uh, we need to not delay in contacting them. We need to have phone conferences and even better, an in-person conference. We need to make sure that we approach them in a manner that we do not seem to be accusing them or somehow implying that if you were doing a better job, we wouldn't be having this conference. We need to look at possible motivations about why a kid is a bully. We need the parents' assistance and figuring out ways to intervene and provide consequences. 
but also address some of the underlying reasons why they're engaging in bullying behavior and get them involved in pro-social activities. Now, how can a parent best support your child when they are the victim? I touched on a few things earlier about the importance of listening. We're going to get this stopped. I'm here for you every step of the way. But it's also really important that we get our children involved in activities and in situations where they are very successful, where they are treated well and respected. And the concept is to help every kid find their niche, an area where they excel, something they really enjoy, a really positive experience because that is going to go a long ways in terms of bully-proofing them. An effective bullying prevention program, well, there are a couple of them that are now listed as evidence-based, the OVAIS program, Steps to Respect, Second Step. We are going to talk in more detail about the importance of a school-wide approach where everybody is engaged and involved in making this a priority. So, those are a couple of the key things that I hope to elaborate more on. I have now been a responder to 12 different school shootings, 11 of those being in the United States and the last one being in Brazil last spring. I know that a decade ago, the Secret Service study of targeted school violence said two-thirds of school shooters were the victims of bullying. Yet, we didn't see in the early part of 2000, 2001, we didn't see the kind of fervor that we have now to do something about bullying prevention. And I'm sorry to say that it took a number of very high profile suicides and the media coming up with the term bully side and now it's very definitely on the national agenda and I'm very glad that it is, but I think we should have realized this a decade ago. This next slide talks about the fact that those that are bullied and victimized are more likely to be depressed, to be suicidal, to make suicide attempts. I've been reviewing the literature on this, and what it really says, especially for boys, is when you're a bullying victim and when we control for psychopathology and depression, then it does not appear to have an effect in terms of later suicidal behavior. But this is an area that needs to be continue uh, to be researched. Probably the most straightforward thing as we look at the literature is there's certainly an association between being victimized and being depressed and suicidal. But is there a causation? That is what the literature has failed to document because there are just so many other variables. But as I said earlier, I always believe we need to be talking about bullying prevention and suicide prevention. And often I'm surprised at how few school personnel are aware of what's called the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey. That survey has been done every two years with high school students and it's very representative of all high school students in America. And the statistics have been remarkably consistent and very, very troubling in that the most recent ones for 2009, we would estimate that 6.3% of all high school kids in America have made a suicide attempt. And that's within the last year. And what's really scary is for the most part, adults don't know who they are. Their friends know about their previous suicide attempt, but not the teachers, not the parents. and a child who has a previous history of suicide attempts is much more likely to make an attempt this afternoon or tomorrow than the person that has never made a previous attempt. And when you look at those slides, does it make any sense to you that in most schools around the country, we hesitate or are afraid to talk to high school kids about what to look for, what to do, how to help yourself, how to help your friends? So, I very much advocate for more suicide prevention. I compliment the states of Tennessee and Texas, which require suicide prevention information every school, every year. But most of our states have not done that. So 
another area that's very important, and I returned to Houston where I worked for 25 years and I gave a major presentation last week. Somebody said, you were the director of psychological services for the third largest district in the state for all those years. What do you wish you'd have done differently? What should you have done more of? I answered honestly, we did not provide enough support to the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth because politically it was not approved. It was actively discouraged. And I do take calls like these from a school counselor in Nebraska that wants to start a gay-straight alliance, but the principal said no, the superintendent said no. And what's the counselor to do? Start an organization, basically provide support, and call it something different. Um, I'm aware of pockets in our country that provide very good support to these young people and other major parts of the country that pretend that they don't have special needs, that they're not harassed and bullied. And by the way, their suicidal behavior has nothing to do with sexual orientation. It has everything to do with rejection, shame, and mistreatment that they receive. And I hope everybody tuned in today will think more about supporting the GLBTQ youth in our nation. And this next slide highlights the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, which has excellent resources, and they've actually been very active in promoting bullying prevention legislation throughout the country. Why do the students bully? Probably all pretty much know these factors, but it's about power. It's about acting out. Perhaps they're the victim in another setting. It's about getting attention. Some of the sociological research is saying that kids actually bully to rise up the ladder of popularity. So those are some of the motivations. Now, there are some differences between boys and girls in the way they do exhibit bullying behavior but both boys and girls do bully. Uh, for the girls, it seems to be much more behind someone's back. It's much more spreading rumors. It's much more about exclusion and leaving someone out. For the boys, it is, of course, much more physical, much more direct and in their face. And we need to recognize these differences. And some of the research talks about if we look at a scenario, you've got the bully, you've got a couple of what are called henchmen, who are sort of the, the wingmen that are along encouraging, and then you have the victim, and then you have all of those bystanders. The literature also talks about bystanders who don't take action often feel bad later that they didn't speak up and they didn't do something to try to reduce the bullying. And Something that's easy for me to say is this. How do we get drugs out of schools, weapons out of schools? How do we stop bullying? Really pretty easy to say. If 75% of the students in any school in America won't tolerate bullying, will take a stand, will tell the administration, won't tolerate drugs being at school, they'll tell the administration, would immediately tell if someone has a weapon on campus, Nobody would engage in those behaviors or bring drugs or weapons to school if you truly believe that three out of four kids are going to take a stand and are going to basically say stop and get adults involved. But I'm not aware of a single school in America that has actually accomplished that. I am a big believer in pledges, safety pledges and anti-bullying pledges. Oh, I know in some of our schools, it's a little more than sign this, take it home, get your parents to sign it, bring it back. But in the best schools, it's part of an ongoing dialogue several times a week in classrooms about safety, about prevention, about stopping bullying. And I used to do a lot of training for homeroom teachers, really trying to get them to use that time to develop relationships with kids to work on social issues to gain a commitment from them because there's so much that we can do about this. 
And I wonder how many of you that are listening have watched the film called Bullied. I believe it's put out by the Southern Law, Poverty. Um, it's the Jamie the Bosney story from Ashland, Wisconsin. He was apparently the first young man in the country to sue schools over his harassment and mistreatment. Uh, Jamie is gay. And uh, a very, very moving documentary that is available to schools free. And there's actual transcripts from the trial. And the principal said things like, well, Boys will be boys, and if you weren't so openly gay, this wouldn't be happening to you. So if you're looking for an excellent documentary, something that is appropriate for grades 6 through 12, it's called Bullied, and it's a very powerful story. Now, interventions when we have a kid who's engaging in the bullying behavior. First of all, they need consequences. They need to know that I'm not keeping a secret about this. I'm going to be alerting all the other staff, and the consequences are going to escalate if this does not stop. And at the same time, we need to be looking at what might be their motivation, what might be the possible reasons for their behavior, but they need to know we're watching. The consequences are inevitable, consistent, non-hostile, and they are going to escalate in severity. So we need to have a conference with their parents, as I talked about earlier. We need to take advantage of what other mental health resources we actually have in our schools. What situations can we put them in to help them develop empathy for others so they will not treat them in this way? So what are the pro-social activities that they could be supervised and involved in? And we need to reward them as they make strides and engage in more appropriate behavior. So sometimes adults will say, oh, come on, Scott, bullying's a part of life. Everybody got bullied. And the other day in a presentation, the moderator ask everybody on the panel and in the audience to stand up if you were ever a victim of bullying. And at first, I like hesitated. I thought, well, I'm on the panel. Do I need to stand up? And then I realized virtually everyone in the room stood up except myself and one other gentleman. And we talked about it later. And what we realized is we both did get bullied. We just had to think back. It obviously wasn't something that was pervasive and had that big of influence on us today, but really, I think everyone has been the victim of bullying, and it does happen in the workplace. And I was involved and interviewed on Good Morning America about the case in California last year, the second grade teacher who was worried about a kid in her class being a bully. And the segment indicated she went to the principal. He didn't really do anything. She went to the superintendent. He didn't do anything. She called law enforcement outside of the school district. And the school district suspended her. And last I knew, she was still on paid leave. They said she violated FERPA, Federal Education Rights to Privacy Act. But, you know, there's been a change in FERPA post-Virginia Tech about if it's an emergency situation, we are supposed to share information to try to make sure that violence doesn't happen and appropriate steps are taken. But then I said she was a second grade teacher. Could a second grader actually really hurt somebody? Well, I served on a national crisis team for many years. We did go to Flint, Michigan, where a six-year-old boy brought a gun to school and shot a seven-year-old girl, his first grade classmate. So I argued that, well, perhaps the teacher could have been a little more patient, but her motivation was good. And what I'll, I will never forget from watching the segment is every other teacher at the elementary school signed a petition basically saying, 
the administration has done the right thing, we have all this handled, et cetera. But you know what I've learned in the workplace is that 100% of people are not going to sign anything. And what I believe is that there was bullying that basically coerced every other staff member into signing something. And to me, it just seemed like they made a mountain out of a molehill. They ended up on Good Morning America. And frankly, I don't think they looked very good. So other times pe people will say, oh, come on, Scott, most kids that, bring, that uh, get bullied, they don't bring a gun to school, they don't shoot someone. Well, thankfully, that is correct. But bullying does take its toll in terms of attendance, in terms of learning. If a kid in a classroom uh, went out to break between classes, and they were intimidated, harassed, humiliated. Does it really matter how great the instructional lesson is going to be when they go back into English class in a few minutes? So bullying does take its toll on learning, attendance, self-esteem, et cetera. We've touched on a little bit the importance of making it a teachable moment for the bystanders or witnesses, an entire school-wide approach, a buy-in from everyone. You know, a teacher will say something like this. Okay, I know we have this state legislation now in Florida and in about 44 other states. She'll say, but I only got 20 minutes of training on this. So this is really something that requires hours and hours of training, not something that we can cover in 20 minutes. And speaking honestly, I'm concerned that sometimes and I say this because I worked in schools for 26 years. On paper, it looks good. But the real question is always, what does this actually mean for a classroom? What does it actually mean for a school? How do we make this a daily part of conducting school? Why don't they tell us? And why don't bystanders get involved? Well, they're not sure of what to do. They often talk about not trusting adults to do the right thing. They're afraid that it's only going to get worse if you're the victim and you tell. They are afraid of retaliation. They are afraid that basically other students will turn on them and they will be ostracized. So it's important that we recognize all of those reasons and we have a dialogue and we talk with students about their important role in stepping forward and stopping bullying. And there's a quote from Mr. Modzaleski, who's been really in charge of school safety now for more than a decade. And he's emphasizing that bystanders must have the courage to say something, step forward, and stop bullying in our schools. School staff, they've got to take immediate action, stand between the bully and the victim, realize it's not appropriate to tell them that they need to work it out. It's not a conflict. It is a victimization and provide additional support for the victim privately. Do not question the victim in front of others. Let everybody know that this is not acceptable behavior include bystanders in conversations about how they can intervene the next time. And consequences for the bully, which we've talked about in several different ways today. Um, I think I've made most of these other points about the bully needs to know that we're watching. I'm not keeping this to myself. All the other staff are going to know, and we're all going to be watching you. Key points for schools. It's really all about attitude. That's why I talked about philosophy earlier. We can't believe that this is like a rite of passage. This is a part of growing up. This is something that everyone goes through. Our goal should be to stop it now, eradicate it, or at least get it down to very, very minimal occurrence of behaviors. The relationship between students and teachers and all school staff is really, really important and having kids connected to school. And an in-service I did recently in upstate New York 
the middle school principal, shared an activity that I really liked, he said, on the staff in service days. He puts a picture of every single kid in the middle school up on the wall, and he says, who knows this kid? What's his name? What's he involved in here in our school? And he gets really concerned when really adults don't know who the kids are. They don't seem to be connected and involved in any of the activities at school. And resiliency, arguably the biggest word in all of psychology today. And I expect everybody who's listening knows somebody that after a traumatic event, it was like their life was over. Maybe they never went back to work. They didn't reinvest in relationships. Maybe they turned to drugs, including alcohol. But I suspect you also know someone who did bounce back. They were always sad about what happened, but they went back to work. They didn't turn to drugs. They did invest in other relationships. And resiliency is a learned behavior, and the keys seem to be when we're surrounded by loving and caring family and friends, when we always remain optimistic about the future, when we're comfortable venting and sharing strong emotions, and when we have problem-solving skills. And one of the key things, I believe, is that kids look to the adults in their life, and those adults are models. And hopefully we have adults that are modeling appropriate behavior, interactions with everyone in their lives, being able to manage stress, being able to resolve problems, being able to support each other. So school program emphasis, I talked earlier about how do we convert that silent majority, the bystanders or witnesses, into a caring majority who do not tolerate bullying. Students need to be taught to stand up to the bully. There are strengths and numbers. And we need discussions. We need role play. And one of the things I'm really excited about is there's an increase in drama and art and kids being able to express their thoughts and basically take a stand and do something about this. Right here in Fort Lauderdale, we have a high school that has the kids wrote the script, they wrote the music, it's an anti-bullying play, they have taken it all over the county. Those in the cast feel they're making a tremendous contribution, and they are. So we need to be thinking about how do we use drama and art to be able to get kids involved, working towards solutions, and reducing bullying. I talked earlier about student surveys. And I'm a very big believer in those in terms of asking questions, but I want to give you one example. Principal um, was very impressed with an instrument. It's called the SARB, S-S-A-R-B, School Safety Assessment and Resource Bank. She wanted to do more about improving safety, reducing bullying, strengthening relationships between kids and the adults in her school, and I was able to get permission for her to use this SARB instrument where kids and teachers fill out a survey. It pinpoints about six different areas in terms of school climate and the other things I mentioned. By the way, it's put out by Sopris West. Because I know the researchers, they said, well, we're going to do it free because this principal is your wife. And I said, well, great. So my wife, Donna, took the instrument in to see the superintendent. He looked through the survey, and he looked up and said, Donna, if we were to ask our staff and students these questions, if we were to pinpoint we had a problem, then we would be held accountable to do something about it, and therefore permission denied. That was so frustrating. I can give you that example from various scenarios, but there is, I think, a changing climate today. I am aware of some school districts that you can log on to the website and you can basically, whether you're a staff member, a student, or a parent, you can fill out um, a survey and call to the attention of school officials what you think 
needs to be happening or what potentially is a problem. Now, the other thing that's really important that's listed here is anonymous reporting. And a number of school systems have gone to this. Actually, there's some very sophisticated uh, programs available in the private sector where kids can log on and anonymously report, and the message goes to several key people in case one of the key individuals is out of town. Uh, the Dade County Schools here in South Florida have a 24-hour tip line that you call, and each and every call, the uh, information is investigated to make sure that appropriate action is being taken. So there are a lot of very positive things going on in schools, and hopefully very few other superintendents would be afraid to ask the questions, thinking that then we'd be held accountable. One of the other things about school safety, though, we talked earlier about survey, find out where it's happening. But perhaps the simplest thing, imagine that you are all my seventh grade students today. And I come in and I give you a copy of the floor plan of the school. And I say, shade in any area in our school where you do not feel safe. Wouldn't I immediately know what hallways, what restrooms, what end of the building there's a problem? And I could even do it by times of the day. This first one, it's labeled before school actually starts, where do you not feel safe? The second one is labeled during the school day. The third one is labeled after school. And immediately, we would know where do we need to increase our supervision, what are our problems, and how can we get students more involved as part of the solution. So this slide that I have up right now, what if my child is bullying others? Well, we need to get a supportive reaction from them. And in every conference I ever have, I always like to begin by receiving information. And I always like to begin by asking parents, how do they think things are going for their child? What are some of the things they love and enjoy about their particular child? And I get really, really worried when they don't say anything positive or they say one thing and then they go to all the negatives. But we need to receive information from the parents then we need to give them some information that, unfortunately, we observed your child bullying others. And then hopefully, we can merge your ideas. We can make a plan of how we're going to work together to have clear and consistent rules for their child's behavior. And we're going to talk about what are some of the things the parents could be doing to give their child more attention for prosocial behaviors. How can we get to the bottom of what's going on? How can we build on their strengths? And I actually believe that all kids do far more right than wrong. And if your child is the victim, to restate a couple of points, we must take it seriously. Do not ignore it. Do not blame your child. And I'm a big believer that every parent has to find the shared activities where their kid will truly talk to them. And we have to be careful that we listen and that we're empathetic and that we don't talk too much. Because sometimes when we become too demanding, too questioning, all of a sudden the conversation is over. So we need to listen and learn as much as we can about these incidents of bullying. Empathize, let them know that the bullying is wrong Ask your child, what do you think would help the situation? Do not encourage physical retaliation. This is sometimes hard for parents because they've already gone out on a limb and said, I just told them if they ever get treated that way, they have my permission to just haul off and hit them. Well, that's not a very good strategy in today's world. It's not a good strategy in schools because understandably, if there's a fight, the administrators are going to going to have to provide consequences to both individuals that are involved. The other thing it's important for parents to do is don't act impulsively. Don't immediately pick up the phone 
and start yelling at somebody at school. Think through how you want this to go. Be composed. Document. Work with the school officials. Do not contact the parents of the child that you believe is engaged in the bullying behavior. Contact the teacher. Document. Be prepared to ask for conferences that do include the principal. And keep records and make a commitment that you're going to do whatever is necessary to get the bullying to stop. That might involve very frequent communication to school personnel because they do want to do the right thing. And I'm always talking to parents about the people who work in schools. They're some of the greatest people I have ever known. They want to do the right thing. You need to work with them, and they will work with you. I'm going to be wrapping this up in a few minutes because I know that uh, we want to allow some time for questions. But this slide talks about helping a particular child become more resistant to bullying, building the friendships, finding their niche, teaching them safety strategies, how and where and when to go for adult help. And of course, we want our homes to be a safe haven. But unfortunately today, with the cyberbullying, with cell phones, with the internet, with Facebook, with Mind, I think it's Mind Formspring, um, this can be very difficult. But I'm also a very big believer that parents should take charge of the technology and that it is a privilege, not a right. There are actually very wonderful programs that will allow parents to record every keystroke. It'll allow parents to control cell phones, see messages, see who's calling who, what, when, what are they saying, et cetera. And any time that you believe your child to be a victim, then I think it makes great sense to take charge of technology. By the way, I'm not a fan of laptops. I think that computer should be a desktop. It should be in the family room, and the cell phone should be handed to mom and dad before kids go to bed. I get calls all the time, and the parent is saying, I don't know what to do. I think she's on the phone or the internet until two and three in the morning on school nights. I can't get her up. Well, I think the answer seems like a pretty simple one to me. Take charge of the technology. I made that statement to middle school parents the other day. They called the principal and said, oh, we loved what he had to say, but we want him to be the one to break it to our kids. Well, I think they missed the point. The point is take charge. You are the adult. There are the evidence-based programs listed on the Stop Bullying Now website from the U.S. Department of Education. A couple of final thoughts as we're wrapping up to see what questions participants might have. Meetings for parents, involve them. Training for all concerned. School-wide programs. Increase staff supervision in all the areas where the bullying occurs the most. Take immediate action. Support the victim, consequent the bully, and make it a teachable moment for all of the bystanders. And of course, it's very important that we stay constantly vigilant. And effective programs in schools can't be this year our priority is. We have to make sure that we continue to have the program be meaningful and consistent. And there is the U.S. Department of Education website. There's some information about me, how I can be contacted, and I have now published about 15 articles for a magazine with a very large circulation for school administrators called District Administration. So I will see what questions uh, there might be for me. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Poland. We've got a lot of questions for you. That was excellent advice. Um, 
Before I get into the questions, I just want to remind everybody that Keenan is an insurance brokerage and consulting firm and not a law firm or an accounting firm. So we're not giving legal advice in this presentation. And the answers provided during the Q&A, if we don't get to your specific question, we will post them so that everybody can benefit from that. Um, I do also want to mention that Dr. Pullen has allowed us to put one of his articles on bullying and allowed us to post it on our PNC bridge, so be sure to check that out. All right, Dr. Poland, we have got a large number of participants today from the community college sector. They are seeing bullying behaviors going beyond middle and high school settings, which are including 18, 19, and 20-year-old students. What are you seeing with these older kids? Well, it's interesting because I, too, have growing awareness. Uh, I have some examples at the university level where I now teach uh, that were actually pretty upsetting to have students that went to faculty members and basically they didn't listen or they even actively discouraged them. And, of course, universities do have student counseling centers, which can certainly provide a lot of support to the person being victimized. And it's important that all students know about those resources that are typically available right on the campus and are absolutely free of charge. But at the same time, it's important that all adults at the university level be alert. They take action. And many of the things that I've talked about would be very appropriate for the adults, whatever level school they work in. And and I'm not surprised with the, the growing awareness today that we're sort of thinking, hey, maybe this doesn't just go away because somebody has finished high school. Would you recommend then that a survey program be set up at the community college level also for safe places or as a jumping point into an anti-bullying program? I think that would be a great idea, and college students are so technologically savvy that probably all we'd have to do is create a website where they can log on, log on and complete the survey. Very good. You mentioned the SSARB as one program. Can you repeat what that stands for sure. and where people can find it? Absolutely. It's called the School Safety Assessment and Resource Bank. It's available from Sopris West, sopriswest.com, S-O-P-R-I-S-W-E-S-T.com. And the uh, computer scored survey then gives the school a printout and lets them know how they scored in the eight areas and the areas where there's concerns it pinpoints them and directs them to resources where they can, if it's a bullying problem, then it'll direct them to those resources. If it's something else, it'll direct them to other resources. Perfect. Um, and finally, do you recommend any quick and easy surveys if we wanted to get started on that type of program? Well, that's a good question. I don't... I don't know that it actually even has to be standardized. I suspect that the people that are listening today, wow, two or three of them could get together and come up with eight questions in the next 10 minutes that we'd really like to have input from our students on. So um, I don't think it necessarily has to be standardized. It's pretty straightforward. How big a problem is it? Have you ever been a victim? Uh, have you ever you know, observe bullying behavior? Have you ever engaged in bullying behavior? Where is it happening in our school? What can we do about it? I mean, those are the things that immediately come to mind. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Poland. I do want to point out that Keenan Safe Schools and Keenan Safe Colleges has many of the courses that you have personally authored on this topic. And we've also just released our workplace bullying because, yes, it does sometimes go beyond the schools and the community colleges, unfortunately. But we have got bullying, suicide, 
prevention programs for everyone. We also have the iSafe program that is a school-based curriculum for classrooms on ideas and verbiage to say to help teach kids about cyber safety. So there are a lot of resources for everyone. Dr. Pollan, I want to thank you very, very much for taking time out of your busy life to help us with our bullying prevention efforts in California. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will have this recorded, and we will post it for you to be able to access. Thank you very much, everyone.